Jerry, it is so exciting to be with you today and to be talking about your exhibition at Woodmere. The illustration arts, the art that you practice, is something that goes way back in the history of our city from the 18th century and from the time of Benjamin Franklin. Philadelphia has been a printing city, a newspaper city, and that has meant a lot in the cultural life of Philadelphia. Artists have been able to build livelihoods as illustrators, and the spirit of illustration and storytelling is one of the deep characteristics that makes the art of Philadelphia its own thing. Well, um, thank you for, for, for sort of briefing us on that history yeah. of illustration, and especially in terms of Philadelphia. I do have to say uh, that as a child growing up and, and that decision to pursue this passion of making images didn't fully understand and grasp <laughs> that part of the history. And I think that's so interesting for me that it's almost in many ways the return uh, to the city is also this sense of um, returning to a roots that I wasn't fully aware of but was always there. But illustration, in so many, many ways, had to be part of my, part of my DNA. Absolutely. As mm -hmm. an artist trained in Philadelphia at the University of the Arts, which for generations has produced the great illustrators of American art. And you are one of them, Jerry. Your work as an artist is at, you know, in my estimation, the very top of the mountain. Of, of illustration artists, you are a master of the watercolor medium, which is your chosen medium. You do it as best as it can be done. And in a museum, we're always looking for those greatest examples. I mean, how does this art form achieve its highest form? You're also an artist, and, and what makes you a great artist to me is the emotional depth of your work the nuance of your storytelling in terms of the humanistic nature of your characters, your ability to wrap them up in a spirit that tells a story through details and through inventive rethinking of the histories and stories that matter in life. None of your books treat small issues. I've also learned that you are a historian, and this exhibition evolved out of the realization, visiting you in your studio, and seeing framed on the wall the cover of the National Geographic issue from 1984. I had to think yeah. there for a minute. But it, it was July. It, it was from July 1984. Yeah, right. Visiting your studio and learning that you provided the illustrations for Charles Bloxon's important history of the Underground Railroad, an article in a popular magazine that changed the way the world understood the Underground Railroad, and you told that story in visual terms. You mentioned visual storytelling. Yeah. Uh, you also talked at length about this practice of watercolor, drawing, mm -hmm. and that, and emotions. Um, first of all, I am a visual storyteller. That's the heart of what uh, I do. This is where it begins. The idea of being a watercolorist or, yeah. or, or, or one who, who loves drawing is only a means to telling a story. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what you see in my work, hopefully what I want to present, is this sense of, of curiosity uh, about uh, a passion for my own history, which, by the way, opens the doors for yeah. other, other, uh, other peoples as well yeah. and their histories, because I think that's always very important. So the, the idea of being a watercolors or, or the idea of, of, yeah. of practice of, of drawing, the, the idea of emotion, comes out of this sense of needing to tell a story and to convey to you, the viewer, the, my, my, my understanding of, of, of what emotions uh, need, mm. to, need to be presented. 
So yeah. it's all about wanting to tell the story in the clearest terms possible. And in order to do that, I have to develop my practice as mm -hmm. a visual artist, which mm -hmm. includes drawing and painting. And watercolor becomes the medium of choice because it's, um, it's, in, it's an intuitive medium. You have yeah. to be present. Uh, and so that, that right. is the urgency and the life in my work. Mm -hmm. So first the story, then the vehicle. How do I tell the story? I, I have the gift to tell it visually. Mm -hmm. So it starts there. And then how do I develop that craft so that I can interest you in yeah. all the fullness of, of, of humanity, which means the horrors as well as the joys. That is so beautiful, Jerry. And you know what I feel like I want to say here is that one, watercolor is a spontaneous and uncontrollable sometimes medium. And so your ability to work with it has to do with those qualities of the medium of the medium and taking advantage of its unpredictability and your ability to control it. And I think that plays out in so many of the images. You're also, a great figurative artist, that rendering the human figure in all of its movements as it moves through space and moves, you know, muscles, bones, faces, it's your, your, your ability as a figurative artist, which some people have and some people don't have, <laughs> you have it. Um, you, you described humanity, and I think what makes you a humanist is something that goes back in Western art to the Italian Renaissance, and it's being able to use figures, people, to describe these stories that then others can read themselves into. And that, for me, is a heart of the humanistic practice that, that glows right out of the pages of all of your books, and especially when you see the original works of art on the walls of the museum's gallery, I think people are just going to be swept up in an experience that's deep and powerful, that gives knowledge, but gives joy and beauty. And I think you described you know, those two aspects of all that you do. Um, in very eloquent terms, and I hope that visitors to the exhibition will um, feel, you know, these many things happening in your work as they go through the show and really feel it. I'd love you, Jerry, to tell me about Freedom's Journal and why is that something, um, you know, what do those words mean and, you know, what is that history? Well, let me first say that that yeah. Freedom's Journal, first, I love the idea of that uh, being the title. Um, and interesting enough, it came out of, a, of a, an image I did for a project yeah. for um, a book titled Sea to Shining Sea, and it was about American history through song. Uh, this was a section devoted to African American history and song. Um, it really was came to by the way of the museum of uh, um, Woodmere, who suggested huh. uh, Hildy, uh, and going through and, and being attracted to an image where I had collaged in uh, a newspaper um, the, uh, heading um, on Freedom's Journal, which was the first um, black newspaper that dealt with the, the black condition in this country. And most of my work springs out of um, uh, a need at a, t at, at, a, at a certain time to say something. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously in my research, trying to, to talk about the history of uh, the black experience, um, felt that that newspaper uh, had something to say. It was an important mm -hmm. element. And so I collaged it over a, um, a, a painting, a watercolor, uh, that spoke about a uh, journey, which was um, uh, with Harriet Tubman being the sort of lead figure. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it spoke about journey, and maybe that's why this title of the newspaper, the name of the newspaper spoke to me, Freedom's Journal. Mm -hmm. And so, um, um, so it was used in that manner as a, a way of, 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 of conveying uh, history, in a sense, um, mm -hmm. through, of course, um, and we are talking about 
uh, print right now. And you mentioned the idea of illustration and print and the history of this United States in terms of uh, viewing history uh, through printed material. So it came out of this sort of a need to, to talk about that mm -hmm. and to talk about journey and uh, to talk about movement and also to talk about identity. So the title is, um, I couldn't think of now moving past for something yeah. other than Freedom's yeah. Journal yeah. because it says it's all, um, it's all there. Yeah. yeah. And it's not only um, um, black history, but it's, it's history in itself, yeah. the sense of it's everyone's um, history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful in what you just said, or maybe this is my interpretation, it's, it's a journal in terms of a record, it's a journey in terms of an experience. Yes. It's also my journey into understanding black history or my roots. That's the journey for me. And I think in many ways that the art you see is you see my search and my thirst to understand my own culture. And in, mm -hmm. in that, um, uh, in being a visual artist, a visual storyteller, I'm able to share my history, my curiosity, my roots, um, and also uh, the full range of from horror to joy. Um, mm -hmm. You're able to see in my work, hopefully, a resilience in, in, mm -hmm. in peoples of, of color. I, I'd love, on the subject of journey, Jerry, I'd, I'd love to ask you to talk about the cover image from the National Geographic for, for a second, and just some of the qualities. Um, you know, I, I, I love that Harriet Tubman gets center stage on the cover of National Geographic's, and I love that it's your image of Harriet Tubman. But I'd love you to talk about some of the qualities of the, the full illustration, just because you know, we don't get the whole image on the cover of National Geographic. They have to crop it and put in the words and, and all yes. that. But, but the image itself really speaks to so many of the, I think a lot of the abstract concepts that, that, that we've been talking about between us. Well, I, I guess uh, let me start with the fact that um, we'll, we won't talk about the cover image just yet, okay. how it was used, but we'll talk about this painting, which is how it was conceived mm -hmm. as a, an image to speak about, one, the anchor, uh, and, and that uh, of Harriet Tubman, mm -hmm. and that in so many ways um, she became central, not only because of her importance in the Underground Railroad, but also because most people, whether you're white or black, can mm -hmm. identify or know one of the stories about Harriet Tubman. Sure. We know that she was a conductor of the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. So that, was, that had to be the lead. And of course, Charles Bloxon also had mm -hmm. a say in all this. Oh. But what you see here, one is um, this, the bridge, which is also uh, you know, a symbol of crossing over from slavery to freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, you also see in, in this image is this deep perspective, which means that the journey started from way back there mm -hmm. and is now at this place. You also see the kind of sense of, um, uh, in the figures themselves, a hopefully a full range of emotion. Yeah. Uh, the, the role of this um, man on his knees uh, giving thanks to God yeah. for this, um, uh, this newfound freedom. Uh, you have um, Harriet Tubman as, again, the anchor and the seriousness mm -hmm. of her expression. Mm -hmm. um, you also see the danger. And it was important that you do see the gun that uh -huh, she wore around. She's holding a gun. Exactly. Yeah. But you can see on, on, the, on, the, on your on viewing it, uh, and you see this figure coming in who is obviously yeah. already has and owns his freedom, uh, welcoming yeah. someone he actually either knows or has that same history that so therefore does know her. Um, so you have all the elements yeah. and then you have water. And water, which was so important to the underground movement and to life itself, uh, because there you have bridge crossing over water, Water meaning water as a source of life. You have to drink water. And the escaping slaves 
use water to throw off the scent from um, uh, slave wow. catchers. Um, wow. So water became an, an element there for sure. Wow. And of course you have that woman who has actually a bundle on her head which is her belonging. So it, 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 and I don't always know, Bill, that I'm doing this until after the painting is completed. That in a sense, I become that conduit for what I think it might have been like. Um, but I don't, I'm, so my experience is in the painting itself. And so oftentimes the elements in the painting as it grows begins to incorporate um, all of those pieces. Uh, and in this case, it was crossing this bridge into Canada. I mean, this to me is a work of art that is also a piece of American history. Yes, yes. Well, it always gets back to in a sense that I'm a, a storyteller. Yeah. I make art to tell a story, uh, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm just using it yeah. visually as opposed to an author who uses words yeah. in a text. Jerry, I'm really excited about the exhibition um, in its entirety because I think that what it allows is a space for us um, as viewers, as Americans, as Philadelphians, to think about um, such an important historical and cultural moment in our nation's history. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a period that's very painful um, that has been very difficult to talk about, the, mm -hmm. the transatlantic slave trade, um, the Middle Passage, all of the trauma and horror of that experience. But then also it, it serves as a moment and as a space for people like you as a visual artist, but also for literary artists mm -hmm. to sort of use it as a, a jumping off point to begin to think about a whole range of things. I mean, do you, do you feel that way as yeah, well? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I, I think, um, and when I think about this exhibition and what it represents to me, and I think about this time that we're living in today, um, yes, it, it is about this conversation uh, about the history of, not only this, of African Americans, but the history of this country. Mm -hmm. What this show represents to me, and, and, and as a jumping off point for conversation, is this larger picture of the world we live in mm -hmm. today. Um, but I think before we, we get to that piece and, and, ex, and, and sort of explore it, we have to talk about the reasons why I got involved mm -hmm. and the importance of this work to me. Mm -hmm. um, and this ability which, uh, to also tackle some of the hard pieces of African American and um, African experience, and that is certainly slavery, the Middle Passage, um, and then the struggle after that. Yes. Um, this all comes out of a need for me to sort of understand myself, mm -hmm. um, to find out my place in this country, which I do love. Mm -hmm. um, so, what you see is this chronicling of um, a, a series of paintings that speak to the existence my existence, mm -hmm. your existence, mm -hmm. uh, visually. Now, one of the things that, w that I think it's important as a visual artist, and maybe writers have this, you can speak to that, mm -hmm. Crystal, at a point, have uh, the same this sense of distancing yourself, emotionally mm -hmm. creating a distance so that we can, I can, as an artist, tackle the hard part, mm -hmm. the hard pieces. Um, and, and you'll see that throughout the old African, but many of the works that I've done over the years where there's this, this separation um, and looking at the American experience, African American experience through a, um, a, a lens of a historian, way mm -hmm. almost a historian might approach it through research and through facts as much as I can gather. And then, and, and then the process starts in trying to tell that story visually, and then allowing at that point that the emotion to throw, flow through me. But it's the distance at first which allows me to tackle the hard parts. You know, there's so many things that, you're, that your comments are making me think about. One is the way that you start with the self, right? That yes. you were trying to understand yourself. And I'm thinking back to, um, in the late 80s when I went to graduate school for my first, for my master's degree. Yes. And I 
had done work as an undergraduate in English and had done some work in African American literature, but came out of college feeling like, I want to teach this material, but there's so much more I need to learn. Yes. And wanted to go and to learn about my own stories, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, and I, and I, I really hadn't thought about that until, like I hadn't remembered all those years ago that that was really what did drive me to graduate school. I wanted to know more yeah. about myself. I wanted to know more about my history. So it makes me think so much about, um, about you as a storyteller and that you take, um, you take the, the images that you create mm -hmm. to tell various types of stories. And as a scholar of African American literature, I'm looking at those narrative artists who are um, telling all kinds of stories. And I'm, I'm thinking about um, a Philadelphia writer, Lorraine Carey, yes. and her book, um, the, the Price of a Child. Mm -hmm. And I was actually at a talk recently with Lorraine, and she talked about um, that fact finding that you just mm -hmm. were mentioning, right? That 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 difference between, I, th I think both Lorraine talk, talks about this and Toni Morrison talks about it, right? That difference between fact and truth. And so Lorraine works on getting the facts. Yes. You work on make sh making sure that the historical moment is correct, right? You make sure that the images are uh, historically accurate. But then there's something else that goes on for writers, for visual artists yeah. like yourself, that you're also getting us to understand and know the truth. Yes. That sort of goes beyond just the facts. Yes. So um, I think about a writer like Toni Morrison, who in her, the sort of the quintessential 20th century novel about American slavery, in my mind, mm -hmm. Beloved, that she does that work of telling us all about facts, right? And we understand these really important facts about the plantation system. And we understand very important facts about certain artifacts as well. But then there's something else about getting us to experience the truth of American slavery. And I think that that comes out so beautifully in your work. And I'm thinking about all of these artists throughout the 20th century that have been trying to get us to, to know the truth yes. about about that experience, right? right? Whether it was our forefathers and mothers coming through the Middle Passage or whether it's um, their lives on plantations or whether it's their struggle to wrest freedom for themselves, right? Yes. Um, and then the new lives that they experienced as free people, as emerging citizens in, in America. Uh, you know, I, th I think it's really exciting to make those connections between the artists, all of you as artists, whether right. it's narrative artists or visual artists. Um, that just comes to, brings to mind, I just had the opportunity to visit MoMA, the Museum of yes. Modern Art, yeah. to see the Charles White uh, exhibition who has uh, been, um, I don't know if I like using the word inspiration, but I don't find another word right now, mm -hmm. but he has been my muse in so many ways because he um, taught me through his art uh, the full range of, of the human experience and, and the black experience. Yeah. And um, I was struck the other day by the sense of uh, dignity and joy mm -hmm. in, in, in his work but also how he presented um, with the slave posters. Yeah. You see that in, in, in my work, this effort uh, to talk about um, the black experience. And in, uh, as Tom Feelings once says, uh, there has to be an elegance to yeah. the work as well. You see it in Charles White. You see my efforts in trying to present to the, 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 the horrors of slavery through a medium that is, in a sense, uh, speaks to life and, and, and joy. Mm -hmm. um, the hope is that I present these hard things um, in such a way that allows that viewer to enter into that space, mm -hmm. um, which is actually my space. Yeah. Uh, and um, so that is, the, that is the hope and the intent of the work. 
So I'm thinking about when you talk about this the space and, and allowing us to come into the space and the beauty of that space, it makes me think about a whole range of writers who have um, given us these various stories and that they and, and when you talk about elegance and dignity and beauty, it also it makes me think about the challenges for both visual artists and and I'm also thinking about musical artists, yes. right? And 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 narrative artists who are attempting to sort of create beauty from often what is quite ugly. Yes. Right. Um, joy from pain. Yes. Um, elevating the experience to almost the sublime out of what could be complete degradation and, and horror, um, certainly trauma and, and devastation. And I'm thinking about all of these artists, and I was also thinking about the image, um, the, uh, the underground railroad image that, um, so this National Geographic mm -hmm. cover, right that gets us as Americans to think about the Underground Railroad right. as, as something other than a train. Yes. And then I think about Colson Whitehead's newest mm -hmm. novel, The Underground Railroad, which makes the railroad right. a train, yeah. right? Yes. And so sort of what, what happens there that we go from sort of the metaphoric to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the actual and, and sort of where we're coming even in this country from sort of the visual and the metaphoric to what, how we're thinking about moving forward. Or, um, or a writer um, like, um, I want to say her name right, Yar Jesse mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and her novel Homegoing mm -hmm. that again is sort of taking us on this long journey that again is thinking about the experiences from the continent of Africa to the United States. And that, that ends in joy and hopefulness yes. and strength and power and victory. Um, that, that for me is very exciting. I, I think it's very exciting. Dark to light. Yes. And, and it brings up something very important that we discussed earlier, and that is how do you, how do you teach yes. slavery or the Middle Passage this dark period in, yes. in, in, in history uh, to, to, how do you teach that to children? Yes. And I think in, in many respects, if we kind of focus there, mm -hmm. if we start with children, we're going to find our way to talk to adults about yes. this material as I think well. You're right. And um, so you, you talked about this sense of coming out of something. Um, and as you were talking, I couldn't think about what it feels like um, for, for getting over a, a bad cold, yeah, and, you, and and all of a sudden you, the cold breaks, and you find yourself in this space, mm -hmm. and you see the world anew mm -hmm. for a short period of time, <laughs> but you do, and and, and I think in, in so many ways um, the the experience of the African um, American experience mm -hmm. in this country is that like that. Yeah. It's like getting over something mm -hmm. and then out of that there is, is, is um, a, a new life. Mm -hmm. and, and even today when, because I think so much of this show, the reason for this show and the reasons for a lot of new publications has to do with slavery's place and how it affects this us today. Yes. Um, and I think that that's important. So getting back to speaking about it in terms of how do you talk to children mm -hmm. about it, um, you have to talk about this ripping, the Africans ripped, uh, ripped away from their homeland mm -hmm. um, and that middle passage mm -hmm. with, with no free will um, to landing into this country, mm -hmm. trying to find and make a new life under being enslaved. Uh, and this sense of, at that time, still adding to this country's history and culture mm -hmm. and being, um, mm -hmm. the importance of, 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 of cotton. Mm -hmm. uh, we have importance of, of needing that cotton to be picked by mm -hmm. enslaved people. And at the same time, propelling um, this country forward right. as, and at the same time, keeping black folks down. Yes. 
but the resilience is that's where we must talk and start with children. Mm -hmm. The resilience of coming out of being captives, being enslaved, uh, being victims to a sense of contribution. Mm -hmm. um, and I love to draw that line of, between Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. Um, and to John Lewis, yeah, uh, uh, and um, and uh, and and then the first black and president, Barack Obama. Obama. That's exactly. Right. <laughs> so there, this is this beautiful arc of promise um, that I think this is also what mm -hmm. good. You can't have that arc of promise if you don't show where you where you came from. That's right. You can't you can't move ahead until you know uh, your history and where it started and how it started. I think that's so important because I know that part of w one of the struggles for for parents who are raising African American children is that they are always thinking about that arc and and often the the criticism that I hear is that um, we, we focus so much on that period of enslavement, right? Mm -hmm. And that they want to see, they want to see sort of the end of the rainbow. Yes. But I love your phrase, the arc of promise, yeah. because if you don't have the beginning of the arc, right, and move through the height of the mm -hmm. arc, right, and get us to that place of promise, you can't see the totality yes. of, of the movement. And, and what we sort of run the risk of doing is that if we, if we don't talk about all of it, we, we run the risk of sort of teaching our children, I think, an, a, something that's imbalanced, right, an imbalanced right. history. And we don't want to do that. We want to teach sort of a balanced, we want to teach an arc of promise. Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a book title. Right. <laughs> I'm worried. I'll look at it. <laughs> that's a book title. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I, I first want to say I, I can't tell you how pleased I am with this exhibition mm -hmm. and the uh, the full set of images um, in being um, on uh, exhibition here at the Woodmere. Um, one of the things that um, I'm also anxious and uh, to see the response to uh, seeing the artwork um, mm -hmm. unrelated directly to a text or uh, mm -hmm. a text block and um, and how people are going to read into that mm -hmm. their 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 own maybe their own story mm -hmm. um, one of the things I always have interested in is how does a person visually read um, a story mm -hmm. And, and in some way, um, one of the intents that I've always had in my work is that the, I've always asked that the viewer uh, invest um, their own story into mm -hmm. my images. And so I'm very curious to see what happens after people leave, this, um, leave the gallery mm -hmm. and what story they have to tell through my storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very curious of that. I mean, I, we see it oftentimes with authors, how at, at there's some point where we, we're in that story and we're part of the story, um, depending on how well that artist uh, tells that story mm -hmm. and, 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 and how well he uh, or she sets up, you mentioned place, mm -hmm. uh, sets up the place that we now enter. Yeah, I'm thinking of that, that question of place is so important in, in narratives, right? So I'm thinking about, let's say, a novel like Beloved that begins with that image with a place, 124, right? This house that has been haunted by the, really the ghost of Setha's dead child. Mm -hmm. And that sense of place, I think, is just, it's, it's, so, it's so important for the reader because it yes. draws us in. And I'm wondering about the old African. I'm looking at this cover image and the way that it sort of establishes place. And I wonder, could you talk a little bit about the beginning of the old African and those images that introduce the text? Yeah. But and I would like to that because it is speaks to my process. Mm -hmm. and, and even though I start with a, a text, I start with something so, that someone else has created. So my, my art is a response 
to a written text. Yes. Yes. So and Julius Lester's words. Julius you're Lester's words is, is the springboard for right. me. Now, one of the things that I try to do is is that I'm not necessarily just um, uh, illustrating a text, uh, but what I think about my work is enlarging or mm. expanding on the mm. text, and I can visually do that. Mm -hmm. If we go back to place, that certainly is a good example. But I want to, I, I, in, in, in terms of, of, of my role in this particular book and how I got into it, um, first you start again with the text, uh, the boy's wrists were tied so that his arms hugged the trunk of a large oak tree. His face was pressed against it as if it were the bosom of the mm. mother he had never known. His back glistened with red, his back glistened red with blood. Whack! That was the start of Julius's text. Yes. Now, I found that part very challenging, mm -hmm. and um, um, and so I needed for my own self to enter in this this book almost as if a reader when when reading this book for the first time would you proceed after that whack and I wasn't sure about mm. that so I needed to the reader to actually enter into that space so what I thought and really carried through was this idea that I wanted you to win that whack, when the text says whack, that you prepared for it, hmm. that you're now in that place. So I oh. began, which is um, kind of a, um, a, a way of figuring that out, and that was I start with an image that perhaps the reader is not quite sure how it fits within the context mm -hmm. of the whole book. There's a slave, escaping slave, and there are a slave catchers and dogs. Um, and that and is the opening, that is right. the opening illustration. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I'm sending you up with a question. We kind of know um, what he is and right. where he's going and what he's trying to or, uh, achieve through this, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Well, and also, is, this image, right, if this is the first image we see, this is not the old African. No. Right? No. So there is this kind of contradistinction between the title of the book that often children are taught, look at the title, look at an image, and, and often uh, with elementary school teachers, they ask their, the children, Imagine, imagine what this book is about. Imagine what you're seeing. Imagine what's going to happen next. And then you give us an image. Which I like the word right? imagine, yeah. because all of a sudden you're trying to, you've, you're placing yourself within this, within this book all That's of a right. sudden. That's so right. So that I introduce, and, and I don't always know, I mean, it's really not always this thought out mm -hmm. as, as sometimes when I explain it. Sometimes it's just really this sense of a need for me to enter into this mm -hmm. project. And in doing so, I'm also figuring out a way for you me, to, me enter to enter it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, we see now in this image, which is mm -hmm. the um, uh, title page, we know that the escaping slave uh, has been caught. Yeah, he's been captured, yes. And, um, but it also introduced what you mentioned the old African, and we know the old African transforms mm -hmm. himself at times into a hawk. And, and we see that now image. Now we there. get to see we, that. But you don't yeah. know that. Right, right. Um, that is, again, setting you, making you invest, you invest something mm -hmm. in this, this, this book. And then we get to a copyright mm -hmm. uh, dedication page mm -hmm. and we see back at the plantation mm -hmm. we see these um, uh, captives enslaved mm -hmm. Igbo uh, looking mm -hmm. out at something that's mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. and yet you are also looking out mm -hmm. um, and then we open to Finally, whack, you get to whack. the image of the whack, yeah. But, but when we arrive at this page, you kind of have a sense that something's going to, dramatic mm -hmm. is going to happen. Um, that's part of the visual storytelling. Um, 
that's the intuitive sense of how I set the reader or set myself up mm -hmm. to enter into that space or that place. You know, we talked about the challenges um, of teaching about the Middle Passage to children. And I'm looking at an image, I'm looking at an image, let's say like this one here. Um, these figures, these men who are chained and are bound to one another, or an image here where on the ship, and you have all of these, you have all of these bodies, right? All of these black bodies that you know are experiencing trauma and pain and are physically restricted. And I wonder, how do we help children enter into this space? Well, I think one of the things that this book represents, and, and maybe that's a guide to this, this, all this whole big picture mm -hmm. of telling children about slavery and the horrors of slavery. The old African represents in so many ways the beginning um, mm -hmm. when we talk about capture and enslavement. We talk about the Middle Passage uh, and we talk about through my art what it must have felt like to be chained, mm -hmm. um, uh, to be in these cramped spaces with your sense of self being ripped away mm -hmm. from you. The old African tells this full story because it ends in a sense um, with this sense of freedom, mm -hmm. uh, of overcoming, of courage, um, and a choice um, that ended in this case, um, uh, because we're not sure w w with the story of the Igbo landing. Mm -hmm. Was that a religious practice? Did they, this, this sense of, um, uh, of going back to Africa um, uh, with this sense of a better life? We don't know whether that better life was a religious practice of mm. a better life or, um, or was it freedom? I guess yeah. it maybe is the same thing. Yeah. But, it, um, but this book represents that arc. Um, because in the end, there is this sense of freedom. Yeah. Yeah, so. You know what, you're making me think about one of my favorite images in the, in the book, and that is this image. And part, part of the reason why I love this image so much is because it makes me think of another really important writer who represents the Middle Passage, and that's playwright August Wilson. Mm -hmm. And in two of his plays, he has two very distinct um, scenes that point very specifically to the Middle Passage. One is in the play Joe Turner's Come and Gone, mm -hmm. and the other is in the play Gem of the Ocean. And in both of those scenes, the respective main characters are envisioning whether it is through sort of almost like spirit possession, but they are envisioning that middle passage and they are envisioning their ancestors and the bones of their ancestors mm -hmm. coming out of the water. And you represent the middle passage so, and I'm, I want it, the word I want to use is beautifully, <laughs> yes. right? For mm -hmm. such a horrible experience, right. but that you've got here these, these bones with the flesh completely picked from them, and then these descendants of mm -hmm. those people who are fully mm -hmm. fleshed out, right. right? And then, but they are all underwater, right? The same water that you yes. were talking about earlier. They're all underwater, but then we're also, what's also represented is all of that underwater life. Right. That potentially could have eaten those people mm -hmm. as food, right? Um, but also, in some ways, seem to be almost protecting yes. those that are... In, in the flesh, mm -hmm. under the water. And I, I, it's just, 
we talked earlier, I'm going to use this image, yeah. right, as right. I'm teaching Wilson because it's it's such a beautiful, you know, could you talk a minute about what you were thinking and what was happening for you? I usually start my images. The thought process is what am I, what am I trying to say? Um, in this image where the Igbo mm -hmm. uh, peoples is all uh, led by uh, the old African in May um, is traveling on the ocean floor mm -hmm. back to Africa. Yeah. So I start with that and I start with this and then oftentimes I use words like like purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that in uh, those two lead characters, the old African in May. Mm -hmm. um, Julius introduces the sharks as a way of talking about um, the necessity for the sharks to, to eat uh, to, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the food actually are, are slaves that were thrown mm -hmm. overboard for mm -hmm. one reason or another. Mm -hmm. the, the sharks come back to apologize mm -hmm. uh, and to these, uh, these, the Igbo. This and is why so they don't look menacing, right? They aren't, and they actually yeah. guide um, mm -hmm. this group of, of, of Igbo back to Nigeria, the shores of Nigeria. So, you know, I'm, I'm mm. honoring the text um, and enlarging on the text, but I also have something as a visual storyteller I wanted to say, and mm -hmm. you can see, and it's really in these two figures, it's purpose and determination. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you've seen that transformation mm -hmm. from the slave mm -hmm. wear mm -hmm. to beginnings to kind of, of yeah. the African yes. um, tribal dress. Yes. Um, so you see that happening. Even the beauty of the colors yes. of those, yes. of the scarves, right? Yeah, and, and, and the beautiful. role of red yes. um, plays, because that was a color that was dominant. Mm -hmm. And um, in the decorative arts of, of, um, and, and the clothing of the Igbo. So all that, all that sort of is, is wrapped in. And, and, and by the way, I should say, that there's always an attempt to get there. Mm -hmm. You have to tell me, the viewer, whether I'm there or not. I'm, I say you're there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love <But> yeah. it. <laughs> um, there is one image that we hadn't talked about that I think uh, was also at, at the, the uh, one of the mm -hmm. difficulties mm -hmm. that I had. And, and that was starting um, with um, the cargo, or the planning, loading planning mm -hmm. drawings and graphics um, uh, that uh, guided, whoa, that's a hard one. Mm -hmm. um, um, slave ships, how mm -hmm. they were going to place these humans mm -hmm. um, into an, an inhuman situation. Yes. And these were, are, were plans. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember when you first saw one of those. I don't know, but I, I, can, I know it was, it's always been there mm -hmm. in a sense. And whether um, I was introduced to it in terms of talking about slavery, I don't know. I For don't me, remember. it was undergrad. I do remember. Oh, mm -hmm. I do remember those, those very nicely planned out. Yes you know, um, diagrams right. of those neatly laid bodies yes. that gave you some sort of false impression exactly. that there was some kind of neat structure right. for putting human beings, or, or, or I should say, um, sort of making human beings into human cargo. Right, um, right. And Establishing I, I a way to maximize space. Absolutely. Um, it was as an undergraduate, and I remember it was very yeah. moving for me. But I had that, that image in, in, implanted on my, my brain. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew then, in a sense, that what was going to be important, that to replace that image. Mm -hmm. To replace that image. Because that image gave us no emotion. Exactly. It gave us no, it gave us no physical bodies. Right. right? right. It, it gave us no pain. No, no. Right? Exactly. It was efficiency. Yeah, and it probably for the um, the slave ship 
that whole sense of slavery gave the slavers a sense of of distancing mm -hmm. themselves through mm -hmm. from humanity. That's right. They were they were cargo. That's right. They were simply cargo. And if you can make these people into cargo, cargo. then you can separate yourself from the atrocities that you were committing. Exactly. Exactly. So what my attempt here was to think about it in terms of always starting in a sense with self. Yes. How would I respond? That's right. Um, and what way would I like to respond? Mm -hmm. um, and then I wanted the full range of emotions. Like we go about our day-to-day -day lives with That's a full right. range of emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, how we face, uh, you know, um, adversity and, and, and something that is hard to deal with. Yeah. And so we know friends and we know people respond to those things differently. So in the whole of a ship, would you be the courageous one who's That's striking right. out? That's right. Would you be the frozen one, so mm -hmm. fearful of, uh, or would you be praying? Mm -hmm. Or singing. Or singing. And or so, crying. yeah, and crying. Right. So, what I of often, and I looked at this mm. image just the other night because I wanted to try to figure out, in a sense, now that I'm some distance from this image, did I achieve what I wanted to? Mm -hmm. And I began to section off different parts of this drawing and, and identify and people. looking at the individuals. Mm -hmm. And now, by the way, the work, the way this work was created, the process was process was to see and draw each individual captive. Mm -hmm. um, I had to do them individually in a way to try to get that full range of emotion. And you can see that when you look here, these are individual people exactly. with faces yes. and their faces have express emotion, their body language exudes emotion, yeah. right? Some are sitting open, some are are sort of clenching fists or wrapping themselves up in mm -hmm. their arms. Some are almost turning away like yeah. they can't stand to look at it. Some look very angry. Yes. Um, I Like this guy, I wonder, is he talking? Is he yelling? Is he singing? I, I think what he's doing is he's, oh, he's, asking hmm. you to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, viewers have that conversation with themselves or with others, mm -hmm. then this piece is successful. Mm -hmm. because, because what you've down done, you've just entered into this picture. Mm -hmm. You've put yourself into the whole of the ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I guess maybe this is the opportunity to go to this one of the, the final images mm -hmm. of this book because it really does express this sense of return mm -hmm. uh, to an, um, and we know that they, they return with a new life. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we get this sort of joyous celebration. It's beautiful. Yeah. Returning yeah. home. Which is, again, mm -hmm. maybe this is how mm -hmm. we teach it through this image. Mm -hmm. And then we just move quickly into the future. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the inauguration of Barack, President Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. And hopeful. Yes, exactly. And gorgeous. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. You, Crystal, you mentioned the cover, and um, so I thought that maybe I would go into a little bit mm -hmm. more detail because um, certainly this is the first image that you see. That you see, yeah. yeah. And um, also the fact that um, this was, uh, it's a different way of looking at a story. It's, 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 con it's capsulizing all the elements um, in, that make up this book, mm -hmm. you know, that full, the full range. Um, so it's, it's, it's probably more challenging than where you have a text to respond to. Yeah. This, is, um, uh, this is your first intro introduction to this, uh, this, this, this story. Um, and it did not come easy, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it came after 
a number of, of, of sketches and also consultation with a editor and art director. And I should say they, they paid, uh, played a large role in this. Mm -hmm. And I, I think out of the many sketches and thumbnail sketches that I did for them, um, they landed on this back view as an idea. Um, as subject, but more as an idea. Mm -hmm. And then out of that grew out of sort of facing down history. Um, um, and um, so one of the challenges I had, because we had talked so often about my full range of emotions mm -hmm. in my, uh, my figures, uh, here was saying, trying to say something else. It's a more, a, a, more of a statement. Yeah, because um, we don't have a face, no, right? We no. have the back, this very right. strong back of this male figure. Right. Um, he, you know, he looks powerful. Yeah, somewhat silhouetted right. against. Um, and but we don't see any emotions no, on his face. No. So what so we have to read is in his body. We read right? in the body and because there's no, you don't see facial, mm -hmm. a face in there. Um, you don't know what he looks like, mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, this is all subconscious. I, mm -hmm. We enter into these things, and they unfold mm -hmm. as we we go, we 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 work them. Um, there is a part of the text that speaks about the ships mm -hmm. and not clouds, and <clears throat> certainly the ship is so important in this mm -hmm. book. So he's facing down this horror. The ship, yeah. Right. He's facing it down, which is almost the conclusion of the, the book. What's facing also down interesting history. is as he's facing this down, also because of the vivid colors that you've used, right. it looks like fire. Well, it represents, it does represent, I mean, the red represents mm -hmm. a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, there is a point where the old masters, this house mm -hmm. gets burnt down, Burns. lightning strikes. Mm -hmm. um, we have red as a dominant color mm -hmm. in the Igbo culture. We also have red as blood. Mm -hmm. We also have red as the sunset, the west. Oh, so, so it represents all of And that of red on the water. The water is, is that <coughs> sunset yeah. in the west, yeah. which is where yeah. certainly the enslaved. Yeah. Uh, end up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, and by the way, um, I wish it would have unfolded in this, the way I, I, I explained it. <laughs> <laughs> that but would be I, the easy I, way. I, exactly. <laughs> but it was a process of really things not working, a lot of things not working to arrive at this cover. Um, and I, I don't think you, when covers be, or any image becomes iconic, the, the intent is is always just to tell the story the best way. Mm -hmm. um, it's again the viewer makes it iconic. Um, well, so as a viewer, so can I tell you something that's really interesting sure. to me? That as we look at this and we're sort of he's facing his future, right? Facing where we're going. It makes me think of another one of your texts. It makes me think about I want to be. Yes. Right. And when we think about what he's facing, right. essentially, although he doesn't know it, I mean, who he's facing is this little girl, right? right? And he's facing the future that ultimately she's going to have as this African-American, right? Yeah. As this black American woman. Yeah. And this girl is looking at all of the possibilities, right? I want to be, mm -hmm. and that I want to be is completely open-ended. In some ways, the way that his vision is, right? Yes. He's facing challenges and facing what's going to be yes. that are going to be very dark and very difficult. But ultimately, who we end up with is this beautiful little girl who has all kinds of possibilities, right? That here she is, standing at the top of the sliding board, right? Mm -hmm. And her arms stretched to the sky and sitting there in the grass and thinking about all of the things that she can become. And using that word become or becoming mm -hmm. makes me think of the first lady, yes. right? To, to our wonderful President Obama, right? This girl and who she's becoming. I want to be, I want to become X, mm -hmm. Y, Z, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I love this image here where she's, the text says, I walked home slowly, I kicked up rocks and dirt, 
that filled the air like tiny butterflies. I held a handful of river water, then I let go of it above my head like rain. And this image of um, this girl here and this man yes. who we find out is a self-portrait of you, right, right? Right, Well, I want to be is my story. It's your story. And, uh, Crystal, could you read the dedication, sure. my dedication? Sure. I think it's in the back of the book. Okay. The very back. Um, yeah. For Dennis and Anstead? That's the, yeah, uh, it's uh, Thylias Moss, but read my... In memory of my mother, Willie May, who encouraged me to be an artist. This is my story. Yes. And I, I'm, again, I, one of the things that I love doing is to see how people respond to my work mm -hmm. and how I respond to my work after that distance. Mm -hmm. Do I mention red? Mm -hmm. which is such a powerful color in the old African. Yeah. Here we see it in a much more joyous way. In her shirt, way. in her exactly, socks. Exactly, exactly. In the flowers, and in your suspenders. In the right? arc of, of hope, which is a rainbow. In the water and the rainbow. Wow. The butterflies. I yes. mean, it's this is absolutely the hope that we're talking exactly. about, right? Yeah. And, and so I've been obsessed with Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, and... In the book, she talks about how it's important for people to tell their stories, yes. right? It's important for everyone to tell his or her story and not to make it be like anybody else's story because yeah. they're unique. And this, is, this gets exactly to what you're talking about, right? You here is a part of your story right. um, and this dedication to your mother and mm -hmm. who, right, all of these folks that actually... Our, our, our protagonist here on the front of the old African. Exactly. Yeah. He doesn't even know that that's what he's yeah. looking at, right? He doesn't even know that those yeah. are the people that he's seeing, but these are, they're us. Yeah, right? exactly. They're, they're us. <laughs> yeah. That makes me happy. Oh, good. In yeah, a moment, in a moment in our nation's history, yeah. in, our, in our contemporary moment, that's filled with a lot of anxiety and consternation and dissension and anger and hatred, right? I look at something like this and it makes me happy. Possibility. It makes me, makes me think about possibilities. Yeah. It makes me think about hope. Right. All right? Okay. It makes me think about flowers and gardens and... And beauty. And beauty. You had mentioned beauty That's earlier. Right. That's yes. right.